Here we go. As I said, I'll be talking for a maximum 45 minutes. It'll be a very informal chat among friends. We're all from Armagh, I take it, yeah? No. Yeah. No? Right. Well, near Armagh. Shout if I'm really saying something that's familiar to an Armagh audience that you're doubtful about, and I'll we'll, we'll try and put in context. Really, so, with the snail boxes. Mm -hmm. We know where the snail box is. The snail box, that's a new one. Yeah. <laughs> it's in Kilmoon Cross. So, kind of easy. A. So, the small streets, I'm going to use the, the term street as a catch all for a residential area, but the small streets, I'm probably not going to talk about terraces like Charman Place or Beresford Row. It's the, usually the, they will run off larger streets, so there'll be English Street and then a small street running off it. Usually they'll have a residential function, so people will live there. Uh, this is the 1835 Ordnance Survey map. Uh, I'll be using other maps as well. And as I said, I'm, I'm going to be using the word street to refer to alleyways and other small residential areas. So this is really the questions we'll be sort of asking ourselves. Looking at very early streets, as early as we can find in the probably late 17th century, or early 18th century. Those small equal poor will be asking that question and diving into some of the valuations to see if that, that, that is actually the case. Whereabouts in the town were they? How did, were they distributed? Who built them? If we can find out where they came from and why they were built, that'd be good. And then of course, you know, of course we'll have to ask who, who lived them? Who, who were the people who occupied the small streets? And there are very few of them still around today. What happened to them? So whether we're able to answer all those questions or not, uh, we'll, we'll see as we go on. So here's a, a, quite an early reference to what I take about a, a, a small, an example of a small street. And you'll see what I was talking about earlier, the wee reference to where I got the info appears down the bottom right. You can choose to ignore it or you can choose to make a note of it if you really want to know all about Ash's survey of Armagh in 1703. And it describes the tenements owned by the Archbishopric's estate. And they're describing one here. Tenement and Yard in Callan Street. Phelan O'Donnelly now lives in it. It contains the front of Callan Street, 18 yards, and Yard about 60 yards long. But what we're interested in, it is bounded to Callan Street to the north and a little road or byway leading from Callan Street to the Common. And the Common in this case was what was known as the Old Common, which was later the property that Dragon Court School was built on. And it's probably that kind of void or waste ground, for want of a better word, between the Ring Road and Navin Street and Irish Street and, and around there. So there was this, this little unnamed small street there in Ashes Survey. That's all we know about it. You know, this is one and only appearance, in, as far as I can gather. We're jumping on to the middle of the 18th century now, John Roke's map of Armagh, where he marks, and it's very hard to see unless I highlight it, which I think I'll be able to do, Quayley's Lane, which is, if we get our bearings, you can just see the, the nave of the old cathedral here, Fickers Hill running here, the public library hasn't been built yet, it would have been here. The city hospital would later be built here, but in 1760 it wasn't erected yet. But running down here and away across what's Sherry's Fields to Armagh people, the playing grounds down there, was Whaley's Lane, probably leading out to the desert, which was a, a route to the, the north west of Armagh. And uh, there it appears, probably its only appearance on the, the maps in 1760, by 1766, this map of the same part of town, you can see that the, the hospital building has been erected and you could probably make a go at tracing the, the run of Whaley's Lane and these property boundaries running off down and across there. Going back to, to Roke's map again, a, Armagh was a monastic centre, so you know the Abbey Lane was a common enough term, and there were several Abbey Lanes and Abbey Streets. Here are two of them, run, one running this way and one across here, both leading to the Franciscan Friary. That's one of the few you know, survivals of medieval Armagh that's, that's still on the go. A. So it's off Lower Irish Street, at least it serves the Franciscan Friary, and it's depicted on, on this map of 1760. A. 
does small equal poor was one of the first questions to say to, to ask. So here we see it on a, I suppose Rook's map's more topographical map, showing you orchards and you know the, the, the gradients of hills and things like that. Whereas this next map is more concerned with property and who owned it. You can see this group of this area of land was uh, Mr. A. Hutchinson owned it. But the, the map is in our collection, but there's a, a reference that goes to the map that's in the Robinson Library. So it's very useful. You can look up the reference, look at number 50 and see what was on it because there's very few clues in these blocks what actually that is meant to represent. But when you look at the, the reference in the library, you'll see that the terms used are cabins. So there's, there's eight cabins here, there's three cabins here and one here. And it was in the reference to Livingstone's map, which this is, there was a bit of a, a hierarchy of residences. You know, there's this fine house, house, single story house, cabin, and then poor cabin. So, you know, it's, it's right at the bottom of, of that type of hierarchy of, of residences. So you could probably say, yeah, I would guess that the, the people who lived there in those houses were small single story thatched buildings and, and not much fun to live in. But I suppose since the enclosure of the domain in 1810, the fact that the Abbey hadn't functioned since the 1500s, the need for Abbey Lane kind of dissipated. And this is a map of 1862 and you can see there's Gallows Hill Lane running off Irish Street. But you know, that, that isn't Abbey Lane. It would have been somewhere here, maybe this gateway represented by the X and overarched gateway would have run into where Abbey Lane once was. So, you know, by the 1830s or 1860s, Abbey Lane had, had disappeared. If we, if we look at another source, which is Lodge's census of Armagh, William, Reverend William Lodge was commissioned by the Archbishop Robinson to go out across Armagh city and, you know, record inhabitants and sizes of families and occupations and whether people were poor or rich or did they have servants in their house or not. And he records the, the lane off Irish Street, which I take to be Abbey Lane in 1770. And in it, at that time, there were 13 households. There's only one named occupation, and he was a grave digger. One person is described as poor, another person is described as very poor, and there were 10 labourers living there. So again, we're, we're probably right on the money saying that, you know, this, this particular small street was occupied by people who weren't very affluent. So we're going to move on to a source that I'm going to be using throughout most of the talk because it's so rich and comprehensive. It's held in the museum here. It's an 1833 valuation and probably a, I described as the 1835 valuation, but it's from the mid 1830s, big manuscript, detailed, detailed valuation of Armagh, a probably compiled to raise taxes for local government for the corporation grand jury to fund the lighting and paving of, of the city at the time. And this is the, the area around uh, Abbey Street and you can see uh, there's three small streets mentioned on this page and I've sort of zoomed in on them. It's Moore's Folly which tells you all you need to know that it wasn't a very successful building project. Uh, there's Wilton's Court and Savage's Court all off of Abbey Street and, and you will see off Irish Street and you will see the descriptions here though I don't think I'm going to go into them uh, you know they're thatched cabins thatched cabins no rear a uh, yard in common so there's just one common yard between this row of 10 houses so again quite poor housing conditions in the 1830s so the next thing I did was went through the whole valuation and tried to extract and use, whether it was a good idea or a bad idea, the terms the valuers used to describe the thoroughfares or streets and gather from that whether they were trying to form different categories of, of streets. So I'm going to call everything streets. In the 1835 valuation, there were 58 of them. Seven of them were described as entries. Five were described as courts. There were five rows, 10 lanes, and three gateways. And I tried to color code them. So, it, you know, what we're talking about tonight is not the blue ones or even the, the, the lanes, the green ones. It's more the brown and, and orangey colored ones that are the, the more, I suppose to me, interesting ones, you know. I suppose the, the kind of a, one anomaly in it is, is the row, which can be poor or small. And we can see that in Beresford Row, which is a very affluent area. So what we're going to do maybe is, is look at each of these five categories in turn and see what it, it can tell us and then maybe look at a, an example of each one. 
So as far as the entries are concerned, and shout out if you don't know where it is, or if you think you know a bit more than I'm telling you about it. John, you would know these places, I'm sure, quite kind of me. Yeah. Well, 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 Woods Entry and Grew's Entry, I think we're in Bambrook Hill area. McGee's Entry, that escapes me where that was. McElroy's Entry is definitely Bambrook as well. Uh, Proctor's Entry, I think, was near Crumbs Court. And Sling's Entry was in the bottom of Ogle Street. Uh, Chapel well, Lane. Well, McGee had been you know, near with the Fife's, you know, the McGee, the Vegetable Bar. It could yeah, have been, but it was a long time before those shops, exactly. so it, it might be or yeah. might not be. But it, and then the one we're going to look at is in bold. So you'll see that in each of these little tables I'm throwing up, there'll be one highlighted in red or bold, and we're going to focus in a wee bit closer on it. And well, I've done this kind of a crude, and whether it's it's a, a good way of doing it or not, I'm no statistician, is that I've, I've tried to invent a thing called a value index to try and work out the, I suppose, the the quality of the properties in each of these things. So in the valuation, it counts how many properties are in the street lane or entry, and then the total for the for that entry. And you divide one by the other, and you get this index here. And you can see Burlington's entry comes out top of, 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 the, rest of, of the list of, of entries. The reason for that probably is that Burlington's entry is a bit of an exception, because it contained not just residences, but stables and a coach house as well, which are included in the valuation, which bumped the bumped the figure up. But you can see most of them are, you know, this arbitrary figure between 1.3 and 3.5, so pr pretty pretty poor. Where you ask is Burlington's entry? It ran parallel, and probably to a certain extent, still does parallel to Thomas Street. So in this photograph, you can see Market House, the library up at the top, the Ritz Cinema, and then. Cathedral just off the top here, and Thomas Street running down here. And Burlington Sanctuary is this area here where it was sheds and outbuildings, but includes some some residences. And we can see, you know, the, here's the, the, the buildings facing Thomas Street, but you can see in here other buildings with chimneys and consequently fireplaces and hearths and probably were homes. So there are residential buildings in there. The, the, sorry, the the undertakers along Thomas Street. Yeah, yeah. I suppose there's the, 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 so Mac McCardle's the undertakers are there, and, and then and behind. Yeah, I think McCardle's is the uh, Burns and Andrew is, is a cul-de-sac, so it runs down and then stops. And I think McCardle's mm -hmm. property is the other side of that wall, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, but is it, that long building still there? The, uh, the, 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 most of that that long building is gone, but these ones aren't. And if you sneak in behind a Decker breaking down the gateway between yes. the Northern Bank. You can go down and have a look yes, and see what's there, and, that, and that's what it looks like. So there's there's the back of the uh, Decker Bright shop, and here the you, know, you can clearly see the chimneys and what were not outbuildings but but poor houses. They're not necessarily called, not necessarily described as mews. That's a wee bit upmarket, isn't it? A <laughs> <laughs> uh, but and, and probably weren't occupied after the 1850s or 60s, you know. But you can see that they had a life and an evolution. The, the, the lower story is the old Armagh conglomerate that John's Wall is made of outside in the Franciscan Ferry. And then you have a limestone rubble upper story. So maybe it was a you know a low one-story thatched house and then was enlarged. And you know something weird's happening with the roof level too. There was, there was maybe an attic added to that house as well. So if you, know, if you knew more about buildings than I do, you could really do a bit of an analysis on how the, the from an archaeological point of view, how the, the buildings developed, but definitely Burns' entry had a has had residences in it. So that's just a reminder of of the entries and the one that we looked at. The, the, the next one are the, are the courts. So they are traditionally, if you think of you know London and you know I think wasn't it Mayor Court was where one of the victims of the uh, Jack the Ripper was murdered. They don't have a good reputation. They are naturally somewhere you would imagine associated with poverty in Victorian, in Victorian times. And in the valuation, there's five courts, Wilton's Saltbox Court, the ever-elusive Saltbox Court, Savage's Court, Cottage Court, and Kelly's Court. Kelly's Court was in Bambrook Hill. And again, like when, you, when you look at my arbitrary in index for the, the, the entries from 1.3 to 3.5, the courts are all coming out, you know, in the, in the very low area. So I'm going to make a good guess in that they were even poorer or, 
you know, less attractive places to live than, than the entries were. Say, so we're going to look at Cottage Court. It was in Cannon Street. This is taken from Windmill Hill, Mount St. Catherine's Convent, looking towards the old cathedral on the back of Vickers Hill. Cannon Street runs up here in Forks at the top. There's the public library, the Robinson Library. So what you see off in the very hollow of Callan Street where some of the older people in the audience might remember the old Katy railway line running through. Uh, just around that point there was a gateway and uh, again that's another thing to say about courts. They were nearly always accessed not through an open gap in the street face but through a covered gateway. So you were going into a kind of muse environment but a very unattractive muse, you know. So th this is Cottage Court. And by the time this photograph was taken in, I'd say probably the last decade of the, the 1800s, the 1890s, or maybe maybe 1900, you can see there's a gap. So one of the buildings has gone, or certainly the roof has gone. So it's maybe not in a prosperous state. Uh, can we zoom in? I think we can and look closer. Uh, so they're, they're single story, they're, they're lofted, which means there's a big high attic. And there were a few of these old houses in Chapel Lane that were just opposite Red Neds at the bottom of Chapel Lane. I remember going into in the early 2000s that were half lofted too. And there was an upper story or a loft, but you had to get the ladder out each night to get up there to sleep, you know. So there were no, there were no stairs and probably no stairs in these houses either. And very distinctive. You know, if you're, you're looking at little eight-paned windows, very narrow eight-paned windows. Uh, what else can you say about it? That they probably smoke, had a common... Smoke coming out of the chimney. The, yeah, yeah. To the right. O over so, here. So, so even in the, what I would call the muse back return of the ones, would that be then? If you yeah. just come across... Yeah. Here, here, yeah. yeah. That, we're we're that going to look at a map so in, in a minute, and, and you'll be able to make out maybe more, mm. because the, the foreshortening of the photograph doesn't make it... Mm. Yeah, that easy to see what's going on. But they had a probably a common area or yard in front, and you can see the washing hanging out in the line here. And the last photograph is a, it's on Providence. I saw it on Facebook and, and copied it. I don't know where it came from. Taken in the early 1970s or late 60s when they were doing that whole development of Callan Street, looking the other way, out, out of town, the, the cathedral behind you and the, the convent school here. But just a few remaining houses of, of Cottage Court still there, and their little okay. distinctive appeal. So they're they're right up until the, the, the early nineteen seventies when when they're finally done away with when Cannon Street was developed. And this is what it looks like in the map. So you can see that would be now called Culdy Drive, I think, used to be Gas Lane, and this is the, the Cottage Court here. And again, see the X mark, and there's a gateway you have to go under to access it and get in there. And these could be probably ash pits opposite each house. But, but no sign, of, probably maybe, I don't know, was this the building with the chimney on it? But no, no sign of a privy or anything attached to each house. And no back door, presuming this is someone's garden or other property, you know, so very constrained and, and claustrophobic place to live. So that, that, that was the, the courts. We'll have a look at the rows now. And I'm going to include Beresford Row just to get an idea of this arbitrary index I've, I've created. You know, that, that, that Quinn's Row, McElroy's Row, Devlin's Row, Jenny's Row even, Callan Row and Palace Row, as well as Beresford Row. You can see, you know, some of the rows are very poor, like Quinn's Row. Well, there's only seven houses, but, like, you know, it comes, comes out lowest of the low. But you can see how the fur against Burrsford Row, which is a very, you know, there's only eight houses on a total value of £687. So, you know, you, you can get a scale of how poor these houses really were. We're going to look at McElroy's Row, and we'll be coming back to it time and again throughout, throughout my ramble. McElroy's Row was on Bamberg Hill, for those of you not familiar. Uh, if you go down Lower English Street, as far as you can go, and the road forks to Railway Street and up over the hill to Bamberg Hill. In maps up until early 20th century, really, the southern side of Bamberg Hill was always referred to Lower English Street until you got to the crest. So you can see Bamberg Hill is the far side near the Moy Road, but McElroy's Road would probably have been termed as being off English Street at that point. This is a, well, it says it's the 1862 Ordnance Survey plan. It's a bad 
photo stuff that we have in our collection. We can zoom in and see a wee bit more detail, but you can see it's, we're, we're at about the limit of what the, the map can tell us about what's there. You can see there's a brickyard beside it. But luckily, the public library, our Arma Robinson Library, had a cracking hand-drawn fair copy of this map, and you can just see the, the, the difference between theirs and, and ours, which is the exact same map, the exact same survey, but it uh, doesn't look like rubbish, it looks quite quite sophisticated. So we'll maybe look at, have a quick look now at how McElroy's road developed and, and fell into disuse. Uh, again, it's called a road, but it is in a sense a court. You could only get into it through this gateway and down that narrow road. No, no back door, just a wall behind and no front either because this pink line is representing a wall. So, you know, there, there was no, a very narrow area here to access your house and immediately behind it access through this uh, little gateway was Devlin's Row, which is slightly more salubrious. It, it had some, they had some sort of a yard and maybe ash pit or privy in the yard and seemed to be built in three semi-detached houses, whereas this was one solid block of a row. This is a 1862 from the, the public library, as I said. By 1889, the same uh, survey, we can see a big gap. We can still see the, the three semi-detached Devlin's row, but McElroy's row has, has disappeared completely. Here's the gateway. You can see someone else has put a fence across here in a little gate, and it's, well, a garden, a piece of waste ground with two trees on it. But, but nothing else there, we can, we can compare what was and, and what is. And, you know, but when the guys were making these maps there in the survey, they weren't just stamping ra random decorative trees here, they, they really meant there was a tree growing there. And look at this photograph taken from the tower of the old cathedral around the turn of the century. Well, we're, we're looking down English Street, you know, to Shapla in, Indian Restaurant. We're looking up Bambrook Hill and away out towards the railway station and, and Blackall Road. But what you can see is distinctly, if I can point them out, one, two, three semi-detached buildings of Devon's Row and the two threes in the waste ground in front. So that's where McElroy's Row. So it doesn't appear to ever be a photograph of it, but there's a photograph of where it once was. <laughs> it's the railway arches top middle, Sean. Aye, that, that's down near Armitage Station Road. Yeah, that's the back of uh, Adrian Donnelly's. Yeah. They're, still, they're still there. They're still there. Yeah. The yeah, ones right are covered, but they're actually still there. Yeah. Well, you can see them from Fane Valley. You can if you go into the yard. Uh, yeah. That's when, right. when does the railway date from? It came to Ireland in 1847. Just you mentioned Drum Incorporated at the beginning, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. And the bit of waste ground that was there. And, and that would have been the railway. That, that would have been the railway, but, but that, yeah. was a, that was the Katy. Uh, Line going to uh, where was it going to in the end? Uh, Cart Cross was it? No, well, but that was a much uh, that, that didn't open until 1908. Yeah, so that was a late line and, and an unsuccessful right. line, you know, the close tall, to past. The tall chimney would be, I say, as I remember, McKenna's chimney, McKenna's mm -hmm. mill at the shambles, and this, this is the mill building. I suppose that, that, that's the chap, the, the shambles clock there, the uh, shambles, right. you, you know, the cupola of, yeah, of the clock. Uh -huh. Because it's so foreshortened, it's, you, yeah. you, it's hard to get a yeah. grip. On, on does the you. census give any information about who was living in any of those places? It does. I didn't dig into the census, but I dug, I dug into later, they call the revision books, we'll be looking at them, and it will give the, the names of the people who, who lived there, but I didn't follow it up by looking at their occupations and their lifestyles. So that was the rows and we concentrated in McElroy's row and we had a look at it. We're going to look at lanes next and lanes are a wee bit different because they could be long or short. It could be between 8 and 135 houses in a lane. My index indicates they're between 3.8 and 9.4. I suppose like the, 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 the courts, there, the lane is maybe an indication of a, of a poorer area. And some of them sort of exist in their own right and don't run off larger streets, such as this Nally Lane, a Charter School Lane, which is now Navin Street, and Callan Street Lane, which is probably the link road that would later be called Gas Lane. And now is, is it Culdy Drive? It's Culdy something or other. 
it's, it's not a place you ever, you know, because Natan's Day is a cul-de-sac now, you don't be in it. So we, we, with Ross Lane, which was a wee small lane, ran off a Castle Street downhill towards St. Malachy School. Barrackwell Lane will be taking a more in-depth look at. Challenge Street Lane, as I say, ran Sorry. past the gas works. Can I just say that for I, I live in Castle Street, the outside. Aye. But in the middle of the street, there's a garage, and that was probably the yeah. entrance to yeah, the Yeah, the, 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 the false door now that indicates yeah. where that was. It yeah. could have been, it, it was closer to Chapel Lane than it was to Market Street, so yeah, it, yeah. it could well yeah. be, yeah. And, and we have the date stone downstairs in the collection, so a yeah. big chunk of rocks and Ross's Lane on it. Okay. A uh, Abbey Lane by this stage was was probably what's now Dawson Street, or it could be the smaller lane that was still called Abbey Lane, running from Linen Hall Street to Thomas Street. Primrose Lane became Primrose Hill later on, and Chapel Lane is the, the one that has retained its name up to now. McCrum's Lane became McCrum's Court, and Church Lane became Cathedral Close, and Lisnally Lane remains as it is. So as I said, we're, we're Going to look at Barrackwell Lane. Barrackwell Lane was near the barracks, but it's named after the old barracks that existed on the site where the present prison stands. That was kind of in a ruinous state by the 1730s. So here's a, a view of Armagh, or a detail of a view of Armagh by James Black, a, drawn in 1811. Probably, well, you can see where it's taken from. So above the jail on that height that a, is near the Free Presbyterian Church now. Back of the jail, mall, obviously, courthouse at far end, and you can see this sort of conglomeration of thatched houses. And if you look at the, well, there's a thatched house there, but it seems to be an outhouse. There's a few in Barrack Street, but you know, it's, it's where the concentration of thatched houses appear to be in this picture of Armagh. And it was a kind of a favourite spot for artists and photographers to stand to get a good view of Armagh from the east so you get various postcards and photographs of that and we're lucky from that point of view that we can they probably didn't intend it but in the foreground Barrack Well Lane appears in quite a few of them. And the courthouse would be very new. Yeah, yeah, ten ten like it was, and then you know, would that can you make out the pavilion sitting in behind it doesn't seem to be there. I mean the, the, this that row of I take it a bit like poplars or conifers running up, presumably are going to the observatory. The, the building right up in the top corner is the Royal School. So there doesn't mm. appear to be room there for the pavilion that I can see. But it was, you know, if the pavilion wasn't built, then it was built a few years later. It is the Regency, Regency, Regency oh, Villa. Okay. So here, here's a photograph again, a bit similar in date to the Callan Street photograph we looked at earlier late 1900s, early 20th century probably. And again, you can still see the, the, the thatched houses. And again, we can zoom in and see them a bit closer. It's a wee bit confusing because of the foreshortening of the photograph. What we're looking at here is a wall that interferes with our view of the houses. So you can see that whole house with its facade and a very neat thatched, thatched roof on it. And then this wall interrupts our view and, and there's a little gate there. So imagine if, if we could climb over the wall and, and get into Barrackwell Lane and look down, that would be the view you would have. So that this is down the slope to what's now George's Street, the shortcut that conveniently takes you around the back of the jail if you're... Yeah. So would these be medi would that be a medieval lane then? You know, would that predate well, it, everything else? It, it certainly is one of the old traditional exits from the city and, and yeah. you know, because it ran parallel to Barrack Hill and went up over the clump and up through the folly you be probably a good idea to conjecture it, it was the forerunner of Barrack Hill, you know. Yes. And certainly you no know, Victoria Street now was not on the scene at all at this point. But yeah, I think it is regarded as an, an old route, we call it an ancient route maybe. I don't, I don't know enough about it, Jill, to, to say but you know because the you know the courts and so on would spring up as a result of the more if you like modern streetscape that yeah, yeah. these would maybe be it's, it, it, it's sort of like the, the last remnants of an old, mm. a, a, an old route out of town, and there's a variety of conditions of the thatching, but this last uh, house has just crumbled, crumbled, and there's nothing left but a few walls. So that's our whistle stop through to, to, through the, those little streets. I just put the streets themselves up to give you an indication of the larger streets. Uh, I suppose with the exception of something called Little Barrack Street, the back looter which has the name street attached to it and probably would 
you know, sit more comfortably with the lanes and alleyways, and it has a you know small index value of two point four. All the rest are gradually climbing the league until you get to probably the figures above. It says I've said here most streets are figures above nine, and the ones we still consider the main streets are all above fifteen. So you know from from there down are all streets that haven't changed their name and have developed and are you know an integral part of the infrastructure of modern RMA. Uh, so th that's all stuff taken from that one 1835-1833 valuation of RMA and a, a, a bit of a, a summary of it. Uh, we're going to jump now to the next next one which is the Griffiths valuation which was done in 1864 for RMA and take a look at how that compares back very, very quickly not in the same kind of detail as we did for that. Uh, so 58 streets, three gateways, five courts, five rows, seven entries, 10 lanes and 18 streets. In Griffiths in 1864, there are no entries. They didn't use that term for one reason or another. There are five rows, six courts, 10 lanes and 21 streets. And now there are four hills as well. So there's, there's things like College Hill and uh, Bambrook Hill and Barrack Hill that didn't feature in the, as, as names in, in that old, old one. Uh, what else can we say about it? There are still 10 lanes, most of them preserved 30 years later. Uh, however, Church Lane has become gentrified into Cathedral Close, uh, probably because John Boyd's Vicar's Choral Houses that were now in the grounds of the cathedral that you know really upped the ante and made that a much more affluent area. Uh, Gallows Hill in the 1835 valuation is now called Gallows Hill Lane. McCrum's Lane now is McCrum's Court. Primrose Lane has become Primrose Street. Uh, and Stable Lane has appeared. You were talking about Stable Lane. That's the, the, the area that runs behind Russell Street, Melbourne Terrace. That although was a, a, a lane or a suite of buildings, appeared to be stables or you know places that there were no people living there. There were stables where people bringing their horses to, to town. I suppose it'd be a good idea because we could do it in Griffiths valuation, we couldn't do it in the Armagh valuation, which was only focusing on the city. We can look at other towns in the area and see what kind of distribution of these small streets that they have. So in Portadown, there are 43 things called streets, six courts, one entry, two rows and seven lanes. Dungannon is only 21 streets, only one court, no entries, two rows. And six lanes. I put a stroke through that. I don't know enough about Dungannon and I haven't the time to dig into it. But certainly Northland Row wouldn't be considered in the same way as the small rows. So it would be more up there with Beresford Row. The, and then the, 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 the kind of an anomaly is, is Lurgan and all the orange names here are courts. Out of the 68 streets, there's 33 courts in Lurgan, no entry, seven rows and 10 lanes. And That'll be a talk in itself, how Lurgan developed this one big long street attracting a huge amount of you know, working class people to work in the emerging weaving factories and linen mills in the area and I suppose entrepreneur landlords who were building cheap accommodation for them in these little areas behind the main street and unlike Armagh which was naturally crowds of streets more or less in a circular area all you had to play with in Lurgan was one main street, so the only option was to build a court off it, and that's maybe an explanation for why Lurgan has so many courts. So we'll just go back to Armagh, and I'll do a summary of some of the ones I've talked about, some of the ones I haven't talked about, just to get a rough idea of the distribution. You'll see we read arrows up here and names as I scoot through these. So there's Kelly's Court in Vanbrook and McElroy's entry that we've looked at. We have Brewery Lane, which ran off Lower English Street. It was more, you know, I suppose, merchants building than industrial. There was a brewery down there as well, so it, it didn't have any well, residential. Still be there, it takes you down to the car I, park. I think it's still a, a, an address or something. I always knew it as Swan Yard. Uh, I remember Swan Yard. Good enough, yeah. uh, it's the same area. It, it would probably be next door to Devon's Pub, just yeah. down, down there. It would take, take you down the back KFC, probably. Somewhere like that. Whaley's Lane, we talked about right at the very start. Cottage Court, which we talked about in Callan Street, with quirky wee windows. Jenny's Row, which I thought was 
too obvious to, to mention. Uh, McCrum's Court, for the same reason, doesn't get a mention in this talk. Burlington Sentry off Thomas Street, but they had a closer look at with a strange two-storey extension. Little Barrack Street, again, haven't concentrated on it. Savage's Court, which was off uh, Irish Street, but I haven't had time to talk about. And Barrackwell Lane, which ran up from the, the old prison. And then the old Abbey Lane, which we mentioned at the, the very, very start. So what I'm going to do now is jump back and maybe pick two examples. And the two examples are going to pick us with McElroy's Row and Barrackwell Lane. And try to talk about linking into the, the people actually who built it and, and maybe even the people who lived there. <coughs> Uh, we know where it is, so should I say Barrack Hill, and at that point a continuation of, of Lower English Street. And if we look at the, the, the valuation for it, we will see that it's a, a guy called James McElroy that gives his name to the row, and these are the people who, who lived there. <coughs> uh, what sort of conditions are they living in? Well, if we screwed across to the right hand side of, of the, the same valuation page, we'll see that at the top it says thatched dwelling, lofted, one story. Same, 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 same. Slated dwelling, same as above. Three of them, and then back to thatched dwelling, same. And then there's a garden at the bottom. And all bracketed with the, the, the note at the side, a, these are wretched hovels. So, you know, the, the, the value is summed it up for us. We don't have to look at the, the, the figures and the valuations to, to know what, what was going on there. A, if we look at Lower English Street, we can see that McElroy also owned some houses here and was renting them out. They're of a different caliber, so they're, they're a bigger, more higher value house. They, they're two stories with, with slated roofs. We don't know a whole lot about it, and to be quite honest, Frank, I, I haven't dug much into who McElroy was, but he does crop up in a 1819 directory with two others. Uh, this is, where is he? James, he's a mason, he's living in English Street. And there's a, a John also, a mason living in English Street. You have to presume they're in some way related. There's also an Alexander who's a carpenter living in Market Street. And we can actually find on the Pronies website, uh, James's will. He died in 19, 1859 and left his property to his wife, Maria. I'm not expecting you to read this. I'm just summarizing what I've highlighted in red. And after her death to his three sons, should they decide to come home from beyond the sea? So mm. I presume they're living high life in America somewhere. Uh, and, and they didn't. When we, we, we look at the next piece of evidence, which is Griffith's valuation. And we can see in 1864 that Maria McElroy is now the landlord, <coughs> getting the rent from the, the tenants in, in, uh, in McElroy's row. So, a very, very useful source if you're doing a bit of research on your property. That Griffith's valuation is a bit of a snapshot in time, 1864. But just like now, the rates people come to your property again and, oh, you built a conservatory, we'll change your, your rates. So there's swimming pool, we'll, we'll change your rates. So the thing called the valuation revision books are in the public records office. They have them online and they're searchable now for free on the Ancestry website, which is very, very useful. And if we look at them, we can follow right up into the 1930s, what, or well, for as long as McElroy's rule uh, lasted, but what was going on there. So th this is the valuation book that spans the years from 1864 to 74, and you can see M Maria there, different tenants coming and going. The way the, the, the books worked, and at first glance it's confusing and a mishmash of, of writing. So each book was useful for about a decade, and to record the changes in a meaningful way, they used coloured inks. And so if, if they put a stroke through your name in blue, they, they put a wee 69 over there to indicate the change happened in 1869. So they're a very useful way of, of uh, wor working out when an event that's recorded here took place. So you can see house, house, house stroked out in 72 and replaced with the word ruins. So we know one house is down. Their house gone, ruins 67. So we know McElroy's Road, they were slowly falling in disrepair and, and into a ruinous state as time went on. And uh, the 1860s, several of the houses were unoccupied. You can see here, if we zoom in another little bit, 
Maria McElroy, who was occupying one of the house. She is stroked out in what date? 1869 and replaced by James Hughes. I have to presume she died at that date and uh, he, he occupied her house after that. This is from the uh, 1870s. Uh, we can see that her Maria McElroy was, and it says her not Maria, her name, but the reps of, so her representatives had disposed of the property and someone called George Sherry was now leasing the properties to the tenants properties and in, in inverted commas, you know, that house was gone, it's ruins, ruins, ruins. And then if we finally get to the final evaluation book that we looked at from the 1893 period, it's a blank page. So it just says ruins and ditto, 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 the whole way down. McElroy's entry had disappeared from the map and disappeared from the valuation records by that point. And this is familiar, we've looked at this before. No longer there. I suppose if, if we jump on from 1889, when that plan was, was made to the early years of the 20th century, the whole area of Blambrook Hill was being developed by the Urban Council and the little houses that were familiar to a generation of 20th century people were being built. This is a photograph of a uh, taken from Blambrook School, looking across at the building of Poplar Street and uh, Walnut Street. And they, all of these quaint names ne next to it was Shamrock Street and there was a uh, Little Patrick Street next to it. And these houses and little streets and communities existed right up until the early 1970s. And you can see here's this Nally Lane Railway Street in Barbrick Hill, Walnut Street, Poplar Street, Shamrock Street, Little Patrick Street, and, and off the top of the page, Walker Street. But I suppose, I suppose for people growing up, our generation and older would have thought, you know, th those streets were sort of set in stone and part of our mass history. It only a, a lifespan of about 60 years, really. You know, but by 1972, when this photograph was taken by uh, Ernest Scott, that's, that's the street we saw being built in 1909. By 1972, it was considered a bit of a slum and ready to be demolished and redeveloped. And uh, we'll be coming back to that. That's, that's, uh, that's Poplar Street in 1972. So I'm deliberately jumping from one end of the town to the other to give it try and keep everybody awake and, and uh, give, give a bit of flavour of, of the different communities. So we're going to jump back to Little Barrack Street now and have a, a closer look at maybe who, maybe not who lived there, but who, who, who built it or who uh, was responsible for the gathering the rents from it. So we, here we, we looked at James Black's 1811 depiction of it. That's his painting from the year before and you can see a more colourful version of Little Barrack Street running up the hill. And this is a lovely map from the collection of the public library from 1782. Because the, the library, as I'm sure most of you know, had an estate. So they owned and still do own quite a bit of property around the town. The rents from which funded the, the administration and running of the library. And what happened was, because we're looking at those valuations, we didn't see the library been mentioned because it was letting it to people who in turn were letting it to other people. So the top landlord, was receiving an annual rent from McElroy or from, in this case, a man called Glenny. So there's the jail, only existing the two wings. You can imagine that the mall stretching down here. They weren't concerned about the mall because that wasn't generating rent from them. That's Barrack Hill, and this is the, as I said, the old road. And you're right, Jill, you know, that, that's indicating it was an ancient route. And it, it gets its name because prior to 1730, the old barracks stood here. And the mansion here is a well, so Barrack Well Street it, it works. Out. And this is a crude depiction of the, of the houses that they existed in the in the seventeen sixties. So no sign of that well today, then. It, you know, it probably We're because the, 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 way, the way the jail expanded in the nineteenth century, it's probably the within the walls of the jail now. Uh, mm. And this is a map from the eighteen thirties, which you, you might think because of the detail would show you quite a bit of information. Unfortunately, this map was designed for valuation purposes too, and there was a low bar set on what would constitute a, a property that could pay the, the local tax. And if it fell below five pounds, it was exempt. So you can see in, little, in Barrack Well Street, there's property one, property two, and property three, which look like one big block or a long building. And in fact, what they are, when you look at the the valuation is 13 houses exempt, 25 houses exempt, and 10 houses mm -hmm. exempt. So you don't get any of the nice detail of who lived in these exempt houses. You just get the fact 
Well, they're not paying tax, so we don't need to bother with them. That pound is still there, isn't it? Well, funny, I was looking at that the other night. Same yeah. position. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, if you look at that... Uh, we're, 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 it seems, we're, to be, seems to be so derelict now. Yeah, so... The pound was for a collection of animals at the days of and, the and for, for days and markets, you know, you, the, the, the animals could be impounded and you'd have to pay yeah. a fine and, and get it re released. You get your dog called Remy out. So, yeah. 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 So if you, if you see, the, there's the jail wall coming down and there's the turn up to Barrack Wells Street and the pound is just on the corner. Mm. But if you look at the, the next map, you'll see there's the turn to Barrack Wells Street. Mm. The whole jail complex is swollen out here. So the pound would have been there. And now the pound that we know is yeah. way down here. So it's, it's a different pound. And, and on the very early map, there seems to be another one sort of getting into the corner of Barrack Street. But, there, you know, there, there were furs and markets held in Barrack Street and Jail Square, and it was the proper, it was a convenient place for the parent to be. So again, like our previous map, this is 1862, giving you a bit more detail on some of those three blocks, you know, we can see probably these are the more affluent houses on, on Barrackwell Lane because they have a yard, and there's a building at the end of the yard, probably a rudimentary toilet of some sort. These didn't have much of a, a back at all, and neither did these. Some of them had a common yard. And again, thanks to the lovely map in the Robinson Library collection, we, we can look at that and the, and the very same one, only in a finer detail. A, yeah, so, so these are probably outdoor toilets, but no such luxury here. And then if we look at the valuation, these are the people who lived in Barrackwell Lane, and they're all renting the property from a, a Joseph Glenny. And again, like McElroy, I haven't dug deep into his biography to find out who he was, but he appears to be a Newry-based solicitor that either inherited or speculated and bought that property at some point. And uh, here's an advert from 1865. After his death, his representatives are advertising. Public auction at the courthouse in Armagh that tenement, tenement premises, Barrack Hill and Barrackwell Lane in the city of Armagh. And you can see how the, the, the you know, it's, it's a prospective investment for someone coming along. They might have to deal with the tenants and, you know, pay uh, a, a member staff to collect the rents. But, you know, it's leased under the guardians of the public library of Armagh. The last lease, lease or renewal thereof having been made by the representatives of late Joseph Glenny for 38 years from 1844. So there was still a good bit to go on, on the lease and they estimated to produce £104 a year. And uh, contact those below if you're, if you're interested. So we can look again at a mm -hmm. Griffiths valuation, 1864. And you can see that still are members of the Glenny family leasing some of the houses, six here, one there, and a few there. But it seems to have been sold off piecemeal, and there's various landlords leasing different parts of it. And we can look at the, the, the uh, revision books to see a wee bit more. We're not going to go through them all, but I thought this one was interesting. It's from the period uh, in the 1870s, early 1870s. And we see an interesting change, not on the tenant, not on the landlord, but in the name of the street where Barrackwell Lane is stroked out and George's Street is inserted. So we know that's the point in time where a thing called George's Street came into being. And there's a nice wee note over in the margin saying, a name changed and new name border placed on house with the consent of the town commissioners. So who George was, we don't know. Certainly the surname George is associated with that part of the world, but I haven't been able to see any property owner called George living there. So as some, as Bill Crawford just said, that's, that's a point that awaits further research. <laughs> just, uh, uh, right here we have George's as a family. That's what I'm saying, it is a surname. It's not king. Yeah, yeah, it's no, no, I mean, it's 1870, like it's, it's 100 years too late for any of the George's, you know. Yeah. Uh, Look a little bit now at through the newspapers the, the kind of conditions and, and hopes and aspirations the people who lived there uh, were, were enduring or, or enjoying. And here's a, a sanitary case brought brought to the, the local uh, 
the local sanitary inspector was someone, a John Lang, who probably was developing Lang's Road and Lang's Crescent. Yeah. Owner of dwelling houses in Barrackwell Lane for neglecting to provide a privy accommodation for his tenants in compliance with a notice served by the inspector, Mr. McLaughlin, stated in previous, previous to the service of the notice, he inspected the premise and found the existence of a nuisance in inverted commas for, you know, raw sewage, the Victorian terms universally used nuisance, and since the service of the notice had visited the place several times and found the yard somewhat cleaner, but that the nuisance was likely to be repeated, the court ordered that the sufficient privity, privy be erected in one month and the defendant to pay eight shillings and sixpence. Uh, so whether or not that was complied with after 1867, I'm, I'm not too sure. The revision books might actually re record that increase in value and that change. Uh, I suppose we're, t we're talking about the you know the the waste and how that was disposed of. What about fresh water and how they accessed it? Well, there was probably a common pump, you know, or or a well, and there were termed fountains. There weren't decorative garden features that we might imagine a fountain to be, but just just a well that the, the people uh, collected their water from. And this is recorded in, in 1879. A petition was read, and, and this was for the, in front of the town commissioners who were in sense the urban council, from the inhabitants of George's Street and Barrackwell Lane to have a fountain erected at the head of George's Street, as it would greatly oblige them. The board thought that the fountain at the Mall and Barrack Street was sufficient for their wants. Cheerio, end of story. No, you're not getting a fountain. It's strange to think that's just, you know, 1880, 1880 just 30 years. Yeah. And 30 years later, you'd be almost in living memory, you know. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, you, when you looked at that, so I can't. You, you're getting on for 80 houses there, all depend on one well in Barrow yes, Street, and, and the council didn't think it's sufficient to get them another well. Not not running water in their houses, just another well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, so the the well, and we talk about Barrack Well, and the, it, you know, the, there are references of the, of the well and wells in this area of the town going right back. And what, what this is, this is from the Ulster Gazette, 1866, and it's one of these things, you know, looking back in the past. And the, the person who writing writing the column here is looking back in the old corporation books from the early 1700s, and it, it says in, in 1734 the, the corporation book recorded that all the geese and ducks seen in the Scott Street Common or about the barrack well or the pool before the barrack gate to be considered a common nuisance. And then he goes on to say a bit more about it. And there's another reference in the in a later 1768 a extract from the, the corporation minutes that five pounds was to be spent making a basin near the barrack well and that the ducks and geese be suffered be suffered not to go into it. So <laughs> So we're talking a bit about Bardwell Lane and the conditions people were living in, not very pleasant. We're going to jump back finally, you'd be glad to hear, to Bambrook Hill and end our story there because, as I said, you know, Kelly's Court, McElroy's Row and places like that kind of disappeared in the late 1800s and then these little, I suppose they were, council houses built by the urban councils, Shamrock Street and, and Patrick Street were built. But even in this area of photograph from the 20s, you can see if you go down towards the junction at, at, at uh, Moy Road. This is Walker Street that was the, the one that linked Railway Street with Bambrook Hill. Just behind it you can see a couple of small houses, almost like a fossil or a remnant of one of these old rows that still existed. And if you imagine standing where this large house is after its demolition and looking towards the back of Walker Street and, and the remains of these houses, you'll see that they were still there in a... This was taken by Ernest Scott in the I think early 1970s and so that's the, the back of Walker Street, the backyard and then these four houses that were probably the last remnants of those 18th century, no better word to describe them but slums and we can get a, a good gory picture of what they were like from a sanitary report that was commissioned in 1898, a local doctor called Dr Gray went prying around every backyard in Armagh and wrote a, I think he was running out of adjectives by the time the report was finished of how he was describing what he found, you know. <clears throat> so, so that little row of houses called Woods' Entry and if we look what he has to say about Woods' Entry, uh, he says it's always in a filthy and fences un unsanitary state, pools of green fatted, fetid manure scattered over it, 
The landlord, Wilson Madole, should be ordered to have the whole surface scraped off it and laid the six inches deep of concrete from one end to the other. There are no yards to these houses, and we saw that when we looked, you know, there's, that isn't their yard, that's these people's yard, so there's probably no back door either. Uh, there's only one privy, an ash pit for all the four. The houses are woods as entry above described. The whole place is an insanity and dangerous to health. Each house should be provided with a yard and ash pit, but very soon afterwards. I have a vague recollection. I think they were used as workshops and outbuildings and things like that in the 1970s. And then at the whole redevelopment of Bambrook Hill, they were finally obliterated. And, you know, sh shortly after the early 1900s, the, the, these houses were, were made. And we're going to finish off maybe talking about some of these houses. So you had Walnut Street, Poplar Street, and then Shamrock Street. And this is the valuation and revision book for Shamrock Street. And you can see the, the, the tenants are changing quite frequently. You know, we're talking about, I can see here, 1938, 1931. So in the space of maybe five years, some of the houses had three, four, five different tenants coming and going in them. And if we look at number 10, where Patrick McGeoch had lived uh, originally, a couple of years later, John Donnelly was there. And then the 1938, Francis Devlin had moved in. And number 10, Shamrock Street, is this house that is 1972 boarded up. But you have to remember that these people lived and raised families and enjoyed their life in, in, in these little modest houses. So if you imagine standing down here, looking at the end of this wall, there's a gate, an iron gate, just taking you into the, the back area around here. And there is Francis Devlin on his motorbike outside his house. Francis was a coal man and originally worked in Turner's, McCartney's selling coal, but by this stage in this photograph was a uh, hawking coal from Newry and selling it around the farms in the countryside, around, around County Armagh with his workmate. Here's a picture of him in his house, 10 Shamrock Street, with his, his wife Susan. And uh, finally, here's a picture of his daughter, Brady, with her young brother, Peter, just outside Shamrock Street, where he is. And uh, Brady's my mum. <laughs> 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 And, there. and I, I never, they'd left Shamrock Street and moved out before I was born, so I never remember Shamrock Street. And finally, finally, Saltbox Court off Primrose Lane, owned by the representatives of Robert Jackson, whoever he was, and occupied by these seven residents. So finally, at the end of that convoluted tour, through a couple of hundred years of Armagh, we finally found Saltbox Court, but this whole different adventure then discovering what was in or around and about Saltbox Court. So folks, thank you very much for your patience. I'll try my best to answer any questions if you've all managed to stay awake. <laughs> so.